On paper, quantum computers promise to crack the most chaotic problems, how molecules combine to make new drugs, the formation of storms or forecast financial crashes. But we're not there yet. Within this next decade, you will start seeing quantum computers in a practical way doing better than regular computers, classical computers in performance or cost or energy consumption. But to reach that ultimate goal where we can solve problems that have never been solved before or are impossible to solve, we're talking a couple of decades from now. Yeah. The potential of quantum supremacy is the reason for the government's big bet, but it could be a long while before it pays off. Tom Clark, Sky News, Harwell. I'm joined live now by Chris Balance, the co-founder and CEO of Oxford Ionics. Chris, it's good to see you. I'm going to you. ask you that question that Tom asked uh, Lord Valance, whether you can explain quantum computing to an idiot like me. I think I can be slightly bolder than uh, Lord Valance here. So the idea of quantum computing is that quantum physics is completely different than classical physics. And things can be in superpositions. This is what Einstein famously called spooky action at a distance. It turns out, you know, the 90 years since Einstein worked out that although it seems spooky, it's just how the world works. This is how, you know, atomic clocks work. This is how transistors even rely on nowadays. And it turns out you can use this weird maths to solve problems in a very, very different way than a conventional computer. And it turns out this just allows us to completely change the world of what we think is computable. As someone who got a D in GCSE physics, I, you lost me there. But I, are you, I'm glad you know what you're talking about, even if we don't understand it. The fact is, do we need to know how it works underneath the bonnet if what comes out of the other end is going to really change how we live our lives? I always like to say when people ask me exactly that question, you know, you say quantum computing sounds spooky, but then you hold up your phone and say, how does your mobile phone work? You know, we can't answer that either, most people. The answer is computers in general are complex, but what they allow us to do is solve problems far faster than we can solve in any other way. And with quantum computers, what we can solve is problems that we don't have a hope of ever solving on even the larger supercomputers today. In thousands of years, we can solve those kind of problems in minutes. So it really allows us to take a whole new realm of problems that we can't solve right now, or we have to go into labs to try and solve them and turn these into things we can solve on computers. And one of those things, or a couple of those things, in fact, that Tom mentioned there are genuinely chaotic and seem to a, you know, a simple mind like mine, very difficult to predict, things like markets uh, changing and, and weather patterns. Can quantum computing really get a handle on what might happen next with those things? It, the best way of thinking about this is looking back to the 1950s, where we could write down the maths behind aerodynamics, so we could write down the maths behind chemistry. Now we can build aircraft that fly right first time by just solving the maths of aerodynamics on supercomputers. But we can't do the same with lots of chemical problems. So a lot of drug discovery, a lot of materials discovery, a lot of building better batteries, we do that by having to go into the labs and experiment. And what quantum computing allows us to do is take this whole new set of problems that we can only really guess at solutions right now and solve them in the same way we can solve many other problems in this world with computers. Chris, we've seen this week NVIDIA become the most valuable company in the world off the back of its success in supporting artificial intelligence with its chips. Where does AI and quantum computing overlap? So they're really very different approaches to the same kind of problems. And the kind of problems are, you know, we might think that computers right now are the powerful they've ever been. You know, you can look at your mobile phone and that has more computing power than a really impressive laptop from a decade ago. But there's still so many problems out there, we just don't have a hope in hell of being able to solve with conventional computing. And this is where AI becomes so exciting, and it's where quantum computing becomes so exciting. So what we're really seeing now is, you know, the, the new computing revolution happening and us working out how we can speed run through it with quantum computing. And the uh, just really to... Oh, sorry to interrupt, Chris. I was just going to finish off. We've just got a, a minute or two left. Uh, with the opening of this national centre, where does this put Britain in terms of the vanguard of quantum computing? So the UK has been a really strong early leader in quantum computing. Lots of the seminal ideas in the 90s came out of the UK, came out of Oxford. Uh, the ideas of how to use quantum computers for doing stuff. Oxford uh, and the UK also had a really flagship program, the National Quantum Program, kicked off in 2014, that's been copied around the world by the EU, by China, by the US. So the UK's got a great early mover advantage. And the big challenge now is whether we want to just do the fundamental research really well or whether we want to capture the big commercial upside of making the titans of industry that, that are going to come out of quantum computing. 
Chris, I really appreciate your time in this and also allowing me to try to follow you. I think we got there, uh, but it says more about your intelligence and my lack of. Thank you very much indeed.